help us as we look into your word now. I will pray that you will breathe on this word so that it will become life, vitality to every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. In the series on church growth, I've already dealt with fishing as it applies to evangelism as well as church it relates to the preaching of the word and bearing fruit. I've dealt with building as it relates to the pattern that God has given in his word and that we should do a work that is solid and that we shouldn't build without foundation. In this message, I want to deal with parenting, being a parent, parenting. There is so much similarity between the family and the flock, and so much similarity too between parenting and pastoring. In fact, the condition in a minister's family will often reflect the situation in the flock that he pastors and in the qualifications given for those who are to be ministers of the gospel the minister's family occupies a conspicuous position in first timothy chapter 3 first timothy chapter 3 from verse 4 one that truleth well is house having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So here we are told that if a person is going to take care of the work of the Lord, he should have a good example in the family. He should have his house set in order. The house or the home is under control. The children are not wayward children, uncontrollable children, unruly children. They shouldn't be drug addicts. They shouldn't be a shame or a reproach to the gospel. That is, the first ministry of the minister is to make sure that he has a well-regulated family because it says if you cannot control the home how then can you control the church it even goes further and tells us that the wives of deacons those who have lower responsibility in the church than the bishop or the pastor the home of such people should also be well regulated in verse 11 even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Sometimes it's the mouth of the wife of the pastor that destroys the ministry of the pastor. Maybe a slanderer. She might be a talebearer. She might even be telling about some of the private lives of the husband to some members of the church. But it says if somebody is going to have an office in the church, he himself must be blameless and the wife must be grave. That is, the character should have some weight, should have some gravity. She shouldn't be a frivolous, careless, light person that members of the church or other ministers around the deacon or the pastor can toss here and there. And then she should be sober, not somebody that is given to a clownish or kind of laughing character, somebody who is never serious. And it says, let the deacons be husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. 
So then we can see that if a man cannot govern his household, he has no hope of succeeding as a leader in the church. To illustrate the similarity between the church and the family more to you, let's consider two instances or two cases of similarity. One, the purpose of the family. One, which we get married because we need companionship or partnership. The Bible says it is not good for the man to be alone. And so we set up a family. We pray to God that he will give us a family so we can have partnership. Number two, procreation. The reason we get married, or part of the purpose of getting married, is procreation. Which means that when we get married, the Lord blesses the marriage, and then children are born to the family. Number three, protection. When a woman is married, the husband acts as a protector, a shield over the wife. And when a man is married, the woman acts as a covering, umbrella, protecting that husband. You see an evangelist or a pastor that is not married yet and he has to cancel a lot of women, there may be some temptations. But if the man is married, then the women in the church and the women on the crusade field, they know that the evangelist or the pastor or the minister is married. It lessens the uh, temptation a great deal. So then, marriage gives protection. Four, preservation. You see, when you are married, you are preserved. If you have a good marriage, and the purpose of God giving us marriage is that we'll be able to have good marriages that will preserve us. One, it preserves posterity. Posterity, your name. Because after you are married and you have children, your name is preserved through those children. The family line is preserved. But not only that for you, it preserves your strength and your health. As a bachelor, there are a lot of things you do that could wear you out or wear you down. But the marriage preserves you, preserves your strength. For the woman too, loneliness could be very destructive. But when you get married, you become preserved. Number five, provision. Marriage gives provision. The husband provides for the needs of the family. And also, the woman provides for the needs of the man. The man may have the money, but the woman can provide the things that will be convenient to take care of the family after the man has provided the materials, the money, the substance. So, on both sides, marriage gives provision. Number six, pleasure. Legitimate pleasure. Legitimate joy. When we get married, in a legitimate way, we can fulfill the needs of the body without guilt, without condemnation, without judgment. If somebody goes into extramarital relationship, that means goes to a relationship with a man or a woman outside the family, that sin, that brings guilt, condemnation, and judgment. But in marriage, pleasure is provided for without guilt, without condemnation. Seven, purity. Each one having his wife for the purpose of purity, to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. Seven things we discover in the purpose of the family. Now, let's go all over again and ask ourselves if this could be God's purpose for the flock, for the church. One, again, 
partnership. Human beings are very lonely. Sinners are very lonely. Guilt makes us lonely. Our sins separate us from God, and our sins separate us from other people. Because of our sins, we are rejected by heaven. We are rejected by our neighbors. Even our own conscience will go against us. But the church is there to bring the message of Christ and one link humanity with the Almighty God. So, the very purpose of the establishment of the church is to create partnership, human divine partnership. So then, as ministers of the gospel, I must be asking myself, is the church fulfilling this purpose of partnership? Are we reconciling people to God? Are we bringing about the relationship between redeemed men and Almighty God himself? So then, one purpose for the church, for the flock, is that there should be partnership. Number two, procreation. It is through this, that is through the church, that Jesus Christ will be able to say at last, in fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, procreation. I said it is through the church and through the ministry of the ministers and the church that that prophecy will be fulfilled. Behold, I and the children whom God has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel. So then, through your own ministry, through my own ministry, God will be able to raise up sons, children, unto himself that are conformable to the image of Christ. The question then is this, if I say I have a ministry, if you say you have a ministry, is the purpose of procreation, fruitfulness, I have chosen you, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen and ordained you that you may bring forth fruit and that your fruit will remain, will abide. Number three, protection. You know, every sinner is exposed to the devil, to the prince of the power of the air. And every sinner in the world is under danger. But it is when with the minister rings out, calls out with the message of life, that the people run into the protection of the Lord. Colossians 1.13 He has translated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. That gives protection. And it also tells us in Psalm 91 verse 1 He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. How can sinful man come to take shelter under the shadow of the Almighty without the church? That is not possible. It is through the message that God has given to the church that man will run away from the danger in the world and then come under the blood of Jesus Christ. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Once again, let's ask ourselves in our ministries, are we fulfilling this purpose? You see, many people do not understand the purpose for the church, the purpose for the flock. They do not provide spiritual protection, covering, umbrella, refuge, fortress for the people that are coming into the church. If we're going to really bring protection to the people, we preach Christ, the blood of Jesus. And in some circles, you never hear anything about the blood of Jesus. And also, we teach about faith. Because it is that faith that will be as a shield. The shield of faith whereby we shall be able to overcome everything that the devil may do. And conquer all the arrows that he may sh shoot forth. Number four, preservation believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have life eternal. You are preserved until eternity. And you really can dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. And of course, you are also preserved physically. He heals. 
emotionally is able to keep you and the things that will bring uh, broken heartedness and hypertension to other people our faith and reliance in Christ will preserve us now we need to be asking ourselves is the ministry of the church fulfilling all these goals all these purposes for the people that come into the church under our ministry five is provision and when you think about it, all the promises of the word of God comes under that area. Because it means all that Christ has provided for us through the death on the cross of Calvary. Salvation is available. Sanctification is available. Healing is available. Holy Ghost baptism is available. In fact, Jesus said, whatsoever ye ask, whatever you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received and ye shall have. And in many places, the messages are so uh, scanty of the promises of God that the people do not know what Christ has provided on the cross of Calvary. Number six, pleasure. Many people think that if you want to be happy, keep out of the church. Because to be happy, they think you have to be at the disco hall, drink, dance, that that's the only way to be happy. But we say, if you want to be miserable, keep out of the church. Because nobody is really happy, essentially happy, fully happy without Christ. And legitimate pleasure, real happiness and joy comes through the ministry of the people that proclaim Christ. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. And of course, purity. And if there is anything that stands out very clearly as to the purpose of the existence of the church is to bring purity back into this world. Since the fall of Adam, the world has been corrupted. There is sin in the nature, there is sin in the practice, there is sin in the custom, there is sin in everything and everywhere. But the church, then we can have purity. And if your church is not is the purpose one partnership two procreation fruitfulness three protection in christ four preservation until eternity five provision of all you will ever need physically spiritually materially anyway six pleasure and seven purity these things outline the purposes for the family and they are very essential also for the church i was um, i brought all this out for you for you to understand the similarity between the family and the flock but as i've talked about the purpose of the family and the flock let's see there are also problems there are problems in the family and you better believe that a lot of families do not know how to get out of the family problems they have. And there are problems in the flock. And a lot of ministers and pastors and preachers do not know how to get out of the problems they have in the flock, in the church. What I've discovered is the problems in the family are very, very similar to the problems in the flock, that is, in the church. And if you can handle the problems in the family, there is hope you'll be able to handle the problems in the flock. Let's think about them one by one. Let's take the family. And as we talk about the family, you think about your own family. I think about my own family. At some of these things that I will mention, are there problems in my family? Are there problems in your family? How can we solve them? How can we get rid of the problems? What are the problems? Let's outline them. Number one, immaturity and insensitivity to each other's needs. If you know anything that ruins family, it is that it may be that when the man got married, he has been so immature, self-centered, self-indulgent. And really, he cannot think of taking care of another person. It's me, mine, I, all the time. And if there is anything that a wife hates, it is when you refer to everything as my car, my children, my mother, my house, 
my Bible, my book, my uh, money. Everything the man is saying is my, my, my. And the woman says, am I a slave here? What do you think I'm doing here? Everything is yours. When we are married, I lost my name. I lost my father's name. I took on your name, but everything is yours now. I've lost what I got before. I'm now empty-handed. It's our family, our children, our house, our car. When you become conscious of the other person and you express it, and you show it in attitude, in everything that you do and say, you are getting matured, and that family will have less problems. But why many people have problems is that they have immaturity. They're too young at the time they got married. And because of that immaturity, they are insensitive to the needs of the other fellow. It may be the woman, she is insensitive to the need of the man. It may be the man, he is insensitive to the need of the woman. That creates problem in the family. Number two, unwholesome, inconsiderate communication. You see, the tongue can do a lot for the family. I think the tongue is more important than even money in the family. If you have a soft tongue, a good tongue, a humorous tongue, if you know how to just dispel fear and sorrow and, you, you know, your wife is timid, you know how to dispel that timidity, but you have the communication of love, you know how to talk that somebody will just feel, I didn't know I'm that important, I didn't know I'm that beautiful, I didn't know that I could do anything good like that. You see something good that the woman has done, oh, you say, oh, this is beautiful. Just like you knew what was in my mind, that was just what I wanted. And you don't talk about, uh, you know, what wasn't right, the place, that one there, why is this one there? Every time you know in the family from morning till evening, why? Why are the children crying? Why is the kitchen dirty? Why is the bathroom wet? And the woman says, my husband, the bathroom is always wet. Why? Children always cry. Why? The kitchen must always be dirty. That's why we do dirty, dirty things. Why? You know, the whole family is full of why, why, why. But you know, if you stop asking why, and you just appreciate the woman, she's doing a lot, she's meant a lot to you, a lot to your ministry. Communication, the things you say, and the way you say them, can make the family better. But if we don't learn that, and we are inconsiderate in our comments. Our comments are sharp. Our comments are heavy. Our comments are very weighty. When we rebuke the wife, it's like we're casting out devil. Now when you do that, there's not going to be peace in that family until there's a change in that communication. Number three, competing relationship with outsiders. You know, if your wife is in the home and she doesn't know who is actually managing that home, whether herself or your mother, you can't have peace in that home. Your mother is there and your mother says, I am the mother. Before you got this man to marry, I gave birth to him. I am important. And the woman has to be competing with the outsider, with your mother. There will be trouble. Or if maybe you have a lot of your, you know, church ministers, they come to you every time when your wife has something important, a burden to share with you, or another minister is knocking. And you say, oh, my church is more important. That minister wants to see me. Uh, you know, forget about what you wanted to say. You go to see the minister. Your wife is crying. Your wife is burdened. Your ha wife has a problem. And yet all the time, all you are concerned about is the ministers the people and things like that it will be very difficult for you to keep that family are you getting what i'm saying therefore let your wife have her rightful place as the one very next to you you are a unit together for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and they too they shall be joined together and they too shall be one flesh don't let outsiders, mother-in-law, father-in-law, friends, and neighbors, and other people come to compete with your wife in your home. 
The same thing, it may be on the woman's side. Every weekend, the woman says, I want to go and see my mother. Something is happening in our village. Something is happening over here. Something is happening over there. Let us understand that we must not allow outsiders to compete with the family. Number four. I see you are not paying attention anymore. You are getting ready for photograph now. Let me get to a convenient place before I stop, then I'll be able to take over later. You understand? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Now, number four. Selfishness, self-indulgence, failure to provide. Uh, you know, the problem with some families is that they never can think of providing for the wife. Every time they will say, oh, my wife, you know, I saw they were, they were having sales, and I saw this good tie. Come and look at it. Doesn't it fit me well? And the woman is looking at the tie, and you brought one in last week, one in the other month, and then when you are going on, on you know, they have invited you a conference of ministers, and you bring out the clothing. You say, my wife, think about it. And I'm going to be a speaker there. Isn't this nice? Isn't this nice? And your wife is thinking internally. Every time, he's the only one that is having nice, nice, nice things. Never remembers me. Never even know that I have a birthday. I take care of him. I cook all the meals. Take care of the children. She can never come back one day and say, my wife, they were having sales. I bought this bag for you. All the, all he says, they were having sales. I bought this uh, shoe for myself. I bought this tie for myself. I bought this suit for myself. Never remembering the wife. Selfishness will destroy the family. Self-indulgence too will destroy the family. And there are many ways in which people have self-indulgence. Uh, there are people, families that never eat together. And you'll be surprised. A minister, he's so hungry, he cannot wait for the wife. The wife has cooked everything, puts all the meal on the table, and then he gets in there, and since he has seen that, you know, cutlery is everything is there, water is there, he just uh, starts. And the woman is, you know, has emptied the whole pot and just put everything there, thinking that I'm waiting for my husband. But the woman that is waiting for her husband, her husband will never wait for her. And then eventually, after finishing everything, uh, he finishes all the soup and all the, uh, all the meat. And then the wife comes and says, ah, honey, you finished everything? Ha, ah, my wife, I like food. <laughs> you, will, you will not mind, you will not mind. Ne next time, next time. And the wife is starving. And when you see both of them, you will not think they are living in the same house. The man is robust and well kept and, you know, is nice and, they, you know, looking good, you know, when, when he dresses. But look at the wife. It's like, you know, she is just a laborer or a villager that has just come to town. And it is this kind of selfishness and self-indulgence, the failure to provide for the wife. This is the thing that destroys the family. Number five unreasonable demand unreasonable demand you know on the one hand the wife can be unreasonable in her demand on the husband you must educate all my junior ones send them to university how about you know I'm an evangelist you know I'm a minister I don't have all that money ah well my father cannot do it because they trained me and I got married to you now you must train all my junior ones my sister that's an unreasonable demand but on the other hand sometimes the man can have unreasonable demand for the wife you know sometimes uh, when you want to fulfill the needs of the body but the wife is sick the wife is weak or the wife has, you know, just uh, put to bed, has just had a child, and therefore she cannot do what you're expecting. And you say, no, that's what, why I got married. I cannot go outside and, you know, do anything. I'm a minister of God. I must satisfy myself. The woman says, look, I'm dying. I'm sick. You know my condition. And that's every time I say, I want this, I want this, you'll be talking about, you know my condition. Let's be understanding. We must not have unreasonable demands from one another, whether physically or financially. Number six, unwise spending. 
money is a real problem in many families. And because of the unwise spending, no budgeting, no looking ahead, the children are there, we never think of how we're going to educate them. And the needs in the family there, we do not know how we're going to educate, how we're going to provide the need. And sometimes the man will have all the money and he'll put it somewhere. Every time the woman says, my husband, what are we going to do now because of the, ah, the man will, you know I'm a minister, our reward is in heaven. There's nothing, there's money in the bank. They do not have joint account. He doesn't understand marriage to that point that the man and the woman, they are one. And therefore you keep joint account. Uh-uh, he doesn't know about that. And he will just bring some cover, 50 naira notes and put it in the drawer. Anytime the woman says, uh, there is no soup, there is nothing, he will say, oh, there is no money. What are we going to do now? Then he will go. He will lock the door when the woman is uh, off somewhere and then count the thing cleverly and then bring a uh, 2 naira 50 cobble out. The 500 naira that is in the cupboard, they will lock it somewhere where the woman will not be able to discover it. And then when the woman comes, uh, you were talking about money the other time. Am I right? Yes, I told you. Nothing at home at all. Well, uh, God will provide for us. Because, uh, well, the condition, you know the condition of the country now, and you know as ministers. And you married, you married a minister. And minister's wife, you must never grumble or complain. Anyway, go and manage this 250 cover. What will I do with 250 cover? Ah, I'm a minister of God. So I don't want to talk about money. You don't want to talk about money. The 500 naira you are hiding somewhere. Let's talk about money. Sometimes this is what destroys the family. Number seven, inconsistent lifestyle. You know, it says in Genesis chapter 49, verse 4, about Reuben, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. If somebody is unstable, maybe you, go, you went into something wrong, a relationship between you and another woman, and your wife knew about it, and you, oh, you pleaded, it will never happen again, it will never happen again. And you don't go to the cross and have the flesh crucified. And have that depravity, that thing that is giving you that tendency to evil, have it uprooted, eradicated, taken out. Every time you say, I'm sorry for this one, you go to another thing again. Or it may be the sharp tongue, the way we talk to our wives, as if she is not a human being. And then after your wife begins to cry and everything, maybe some people in your church will come and settle quarrel for you and your wife. What a shame. And then eventually you'll say, I'll never do that again. Everything is all right now. We we'll forgive one another. Let us relate as if we never offended one another. After two weeks again, problem. Inconsistent lifestyle can ruin the family. Let me just summarize so that we can uh, we'll come back for the uh, other part of the message later. But let me just summarize this section. Problems of the family, I've told you. Let us apply this to the flock, to the church. Number one, immaturity. When a pastor is immature, doesn't have self-control, is not under the control of the spirit. The moment he hears something has happened in a section of the church, he has not investigated, he has not found out, he, has, he doesn't know who guilty. The moment he sees that thing, he comes to the platform, he blasts everybody. You will scatter your own church. That's immaturity. Does our Lord judge any man before he knows what he does? You, as a matured person, you will look into what is happening in the church. And then you'll pray for wisdom. And when things are inconvenient for you, people are causing trouble, you approach that thing with the maturity of a real minister. And you are sensitive to the needs of other people. We do not have the time to read all the scriptures now, but look at Acts chapter 6. They were sensitive to the problem that came up in the church. They provided solution. Number two, unwholesome, inconsiderate communication. You know, when we are preaching, we should be very selective in the illustrations that we make. 
when you make illustrations in your messages and a particular family in the church that had problem with you or with the church before will think, oh, pastor has not forgiven our family. That illustration is knocking our family again. And you are having a good time preaching, illustrating, demonstrating, and there is somebody in the congregation saying, we are not accepted here. We don't belong here. Every time they are throwing that the word that everybody knows they are preaching at us, your communication, your illustrations, and the things you say can destroy that flock and destroy that church. Number three, competing relationship with outsiders. Uh, you see, uh, whenever as a pastor in the church, people watch your relationships. If they see that the Jehovah's Witnesses are, you know, related to you, I'm not talking about natural relationship, that, you know, you're always welcoming them, arguing with them, discussing with them. You might give them an inroad into your church. If they see that, you know, any false prophet or syncretic idea that comes in, you're, you're all the time looking into that thing. It might bring difficulty upon the membership in your church. And of course, the world is the enemy of the church. If you bring in the world into the church, that relationship with the outside world will destroy the church. Number four, selfishness, self-indulgence, and failure to provide. You see, if you are selfish, people can easily tell when you're on the pulpit. Because all you'll be talking about will be, I've been pastoring this church now, you hold Lord, 500 people. There's another pastor downtown there. He pastors only 200 people. He's using a car. I don't have a motorcycle. And you come the other time and you said, well, thank God I'm a pastor. I have the call of God. If it were not for the call of God, all you lot, I would have left you long ago. Now, my, my child cannot pay school fees in the, in the school. I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. God will provide for me. But just to tell you, you are not helping me, you are not providing for me. Every time he comes, he has something to say about when the church is not providing for him, the church is not taking care of him, the church is not doing that, not doing that. You see, you will destroy that church. They will scatter. But if you can keep your problems under cover and then preach the word, and do not look at the people as your provider. Look at God who called you as your provider. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Trust him, he will never fail you. And so, we also have number five, unreasonable demands. Do you know there are pastors that have unreasonable demands on the congregation? They might even say, they can come to the church and announce and say, well, church, I've sacrificed enough. I need to tell you that since I came to this church, I never told anybody I've been on this level of salary. But calls have been coming from outside. I could have gone to another church long ago, but now I've, come to the, I've been pushed to the wall. This is what I'm saying. And then if you don't increase and double my salary immediately, I'm going to another place. And then the people will meet together. They say, what offering is coming to the church? The offering is not up to what you are demanding. We are not serving so that we can get money. Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He gave himself freely for us. And we should be able to give ourselves. And at, when the time comes, the Lord will take care of us. He will not fail. Will he fail? Unwise spending. Do you know there are pastors? They have never studied accountancy, bookkeeping, budgeting, any of the things that those people that deal with money that they know. But the pastor, he is a pastor. He is a bookkeeper. He is the one that counts the offering. He is the one that banks the offering. Is the one that withdraws the offering. Is the one that handles the whole money. Anything you need when they say, we need a five naira. He will say, okay, uh, turn your back. Uh, face that way. And then he will, you know, bring the thing out. Don't turn yet. 
And after counting the thing, and then he put the rest in the pocket, okay, you can turn away, come, come here now. How much did you say you needed? Uh, we need a five naira, okay, go and manage this uh, three naira. The church doesn't have money. Nobody knows the accounts of the church. Nobody knows how much money the church has. It's only the one that knows. If he says there's no money, there's no money. When you, when you do like that, nobody will trust you. They won't have confidence in you. On wise spending. And in a church, there should be budgeting, goal setting. You know what you want to spend, and you, you know what you have. You order the things that the church needs. A, B, C. Things that are very indispensable. You just can't do without them in the church. Things that are important but not indispensable. And the other things that, well, if we have them, it will give us convenience and luxury. That's lower on the list. You order your priorities. And it's not just you alone doing it. You have people with you. Like, uh, you know, we are taught this morning, you build a team around you that you'll be able to get these things done. Another thing destroying the church, problems we have in the church, inconsistent lifestyle. When you cannot take the word of the pastor or minister seriously. Any story he tells you, he always exaggerates. Any number of figure he gives you, there's an elastic ability that he has. He's able to prolong a little thing and make it very wide. You cannot trust him. Any testimony he gives you, you have to go and check it up. Because you cannot just believe him like that. Otherwise, you might get yourself into trouble. Inconsistent lifestyle. Problems in the family. Let's pray that God will give us grace to overcome those problems in the family. Similar problems in the flock. May God help all of us ministers here to be able to overcome those problems in Jesus' name. Let's just rise up uh, briefly and talk to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your name for the revelation of the purpose for the family and the purpose for the flock. And also we thank you because we've opened our eyes to see some of the problems in the family, some of the problems in the flock, and we pray that you'll give us the grace. These problems will be solved in Jesus' name. Help us to be sincere enough, open enough, dedicated enough, surrendered enough to want to have all these problems in the family, all these problems in the flock, to have them solved in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are ready for the photo.